Hello and welcome to the question and answer session for the Linking STEM Curriculum Learning to Careers online course. Uh, my name is Matt Cornock, I'm the online CPD coordinator and we've been joined today by both Neil Willis and Gerard Liston who are co-authors on the course and we're going to answer some of the, the questions arising from themes uh, from learner participation in the course. So uh, good morning to you both. Good morning. And um, the first question is on using as the aspirations questionnaire. Um, so in, very early on in the course, we actually look at um, getting an idea of what our students believe about STEM careers. And one of the aspects that's been raised is if students believe that STEM careers are only relevant if you are clever, what can you actually do to change those attitudes? So who would like to go first on that one? Um, yeah, I'm happy. So... I would say that um, in the first instance that um, this often stems from a lack of confidence um, and my experience would be that the, the lack of confidence is often due to unclear or quite patchy information and guidance actually about the careers pathways in the STEM sector. Um, so what can we do about it? I guess firstly um, it's about demonstration, so it's about demonstrating to young people um, the skill sets that are required in that sector and how that kind of relates to them as a person, how it relates to their everyday life, how it relates to the things that they're doing at school. Um, so kind of through showing rather than just telling um, you know, this is the sector, this is what you need to do. You kind of, by relating it to things that they're familiar with, I think helps to um, build that confidence. Um, I would also say that I don't think that as educators we should shy away from the fact that some STEM careers do require a high level of skill and knowledge and are challenging. Because when we're trying to raise aspirations of young people, it's important that, you know, there is challenge for them to work towards. There are things that are difficult, um, you know, and as educators, that's an important thing we should always sort of look at. Um, and those jobs, you know, do bring work satisfaction. They bring fulfillment, you know, in the workplace. So I think it's important that um, that we don't shy away that some, you know, careers within the STEM sector are you know, are challenging, require high levels of skill. But I guess what sort of to, to sort of summarise, I think one of the important things is about um, showing young people that there are entry points at all levels into the STEM sector. So from level one courses, you know, leaving school at 16, we can sort of go on level one and level two courses right through to um, postgraduate level entry points. And I think by just making the information and guidance clearer, I think, starts to build confidence and starts them to help to see their place in the STEM sector. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much, Neil. Gerard, what, what, what's your thoughts on this? I think um, my reaction is that is to be guarded about directly, particularly at school uh, and you know, particularly early stages in school, directly connecting STEM subjects with STEM careers because the, really what we're trying to do is encourage young people to think about their options, keep them wide open uh, in the early stages particularly. Um, so really what we're wanting to do is certainly encourage them to see the point of learning STEM subjects and be motivated about that, even if some of them they might find hard, and to realise that uh, organisations that might be categorised as STEM actually offer a wealth of opportunities which aren't necessarily STEM related. You know, there are plenty of accountants and marketing um, people working within engineering firms, for example. So I think what we're trying to do by involving, as the topic of this course is, to uh, bring STEM learning to life, to, to connect careers with STEM learning, actually we should be using those encounters with employers if that's happening to encourage people to think broadly about what might be ahead of them the possibilities rather than narrowing their thinking down to for example job titles and that's an, in an interesting point actually about job titles because uh, in one of the videos we see one of the teachers um, encourage their students to um, put on post-it notes different 
possible STEM careers. And those job titles are often quite limited, aren't yeah. they? It's, it's engineering is put into one big bucket of yeah. the engineer, but without thinking the different types of engineer that might be available. Exactly. Um, so it, it, based on that idea, if you're trying to raise aspirations, how can you broaden that that awareness of the different job titles or even different roles? Well, personally, I think it's why involving employers is so valuable because very often, even if somebody comes from, let's say, an engineering firm uh, like Rolls-Royce or a small local engineering firm, uh, they'll come with a job title and a career path which will interest young people. And it's often that story, that narrative, which wakens young people up to the possibilities. So what you really want is them to be interested, maybe intrigued, maybe um, inspired by that guest person, that guest visitor. But to ask themselves afterwards, well, I didn't know about that role. What else is there? And to be, start to inquire about the possibilities apart from that. You know, we do want to inspire them, but we're not wanting them to say, I want to be a chemical engineer only. We want them to be thinking, gosh, what else is there? So it's keeping those options open then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Neil, you mentioned there about entry points. Um, so not just thinking about the STEM careers that require um, a, a, a degree, but STEM careers that any any student could find an, an entry point into. Is that something that it, it, do you think is easy for teachers to, to become more aware of? I think it's, um, I think traditionally I would say uh, no. Um, I think that there is a lot of improved guidance that's emerging from both, you know, sectoral organisations, but also, you know, training providers, etc. cetera. Um, certainly sort of with the, with the bigger work around the career strategy across, you know, across the country, you know, schools are thinking more clearly and having to demonstrate how are they providing that um, sort of equity of guidance to meet the individual needs of all students. Um, you know, trad traditionally teachers quite often, if you ask them, well, you need to go and do a degree, you know, that's quite often a response, especially sort of in the science sector. Um, but we know that that isn't necessarily the case. So there's that piece of work that needs to be done, you know, about change in sort of mindsets and updating some of the information you know that is out there for teachers to access um and therefore that you know we know that they are primary influences of young people and therefore it's of vital importance that they are equipped with you know at least some of the the key principles of you know the current guidance that we can give that's up to date we don't expect teachers to be one to one offering one to one personal guidance, but just having that sort of bigger awareness of what's happening in their region, what's happening nationally and globally in terms of the subject they're teaching and the pathways that that can lead to, I think is really important. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks very much, you both, for your responses to that one. I, I've got a, a a more tricky um, question for the second question, which um, I, I think I hear I'm looking at how do we take things a bit further? Because there's one video which in the course uh, in design and technology, the teacher is explaining why a particular hinge is developed in a particular way um, to create a locking mechanism to make things more efficient on a production line than if it was a screw type vice or something along, along those lines. And one of the comments from the course was that this really does go beyond um, linking to a career, it actually looks at the motivations behind why something might be done in a particular way. So in this case, it's design and technology, the motivation is about efficiency, time and money. What do you think is the best way or even should teachers go to the level of uncovering those motivations? Um, where, where's the boundary here? How far should we go in terms of linking the curriculum to STEM careers and the STEM sector? I mean, for, I think that there is, um, so, uh, you know, we are setting the, the foundations for uh, in terms of the STEM education and the knowledge. And part of that is very much about how is this applied um, in current workplaces and how, the, how is this applied, you know, in potentially the future workforce. So 
I really think that this is, and I'm sure, you know, Gerard will sort of um, be able to, you know, talk at this in depth from his experience as well. But I think this is really when the power of both teacher placements and um, co-development of curriculum work and projects with employers becomes particularly evident. So we know that STEM teachers are able to access opportunities to spend time with employers, you know, in terms of STEM learning through things like the Grand Challenge placement that's currently sort of on offer and the STEM Insight program and through other initi initiatives in different areas of the country. One of the, the key things here is it may start, sometimes often starts about sort of the, the nitty gritty of application of knowledge in the workplace. But often what we find with those interactions and that co-development work is that teachers really sort of understand the, what I would class as and what we're talking about here is business process that also is part of that application. So I'll give you an example. Um, a group of teachers were working with quite a large global digital solution company up here in the Northeast. And initially they were looking at how can we bring aspects of maths and computing sort of to life through, through working with this company. And actually what it turned into was a discussion around the, the collaborative innovation process that this company um, uses to develop their next products and, de and develop their solutions. And the teachers actually went away. Instead of thinking so much about the knowledge and the content, they looked at how they could apply that same process to students working together um, through homework tasks and becoming more independent and becoming and, um, and carrying out some of their work more collaborative, collaboratively with their peers. So I think it own, these things come about through the rich engagement that teachers can have with employers when they start to look at aspects of curriculum. Um, and I'm sure sort of Gerard can pick up further probably on that as well. Well, I agree with you. I think uh, um, when we talk about multiple encounters with employers, actually the teachers are there too. And uh, uh, it's not just the young people that are the beneficiaries of uh, an employer showing what a STEM subject can look like in practice in the, in the workplace. Uh, and of course, one of the challenges with schools is that um, you know, the, the teachers increasingly are finding that they're not released for things like work placements, which they used to be fairly routinely, if you would go back not too many years. I think that's unfortunate, but it's a reality. And so I think, you know, you. The, the example that was given was really about how do you uh, illustrate, um, you know, problem solving in the in the workplace and discover that you know engineering isn't just about nuts and bolts; it's about fixing things, making things work, and finding fresh solutions, fresh ideas. So you want young people to see that actually there's something exciting, creative about, for example, working in an engineering sector. Um, but it's the fact that teacher will see that too; they will get the input, uh, the reality from that employer who may be talking about what they do in, in practice, or as you, you know, the example you gave was about um, a real challenge that's set. And I, you know, I can think of any number of projects where that's exactly what's happened. The young people have been set a real purposeful challenge by an employer. But um, it's the fact that uh, the young people are working on it, supported by a teacher, inevitably, if it's properly embedded within the classroom, it should, in, within the subject of teaching, the teacher should be there throughout. And that means at the start when the challenge is set and at the end probably when the employer comes back in to see the solutions and give some feedback. So I think we shouldn't forget that it's not just students that benefit from that kind of encounter. So in, in terms of, of uh, the sort of the level of depth that teachers should go to then, I mean, obviously if a teacher is first starting out on this, should they, would you recommend they dive straight into this level of detail or should they maybe build themselves up over a number of years? Personally, I, I, they should never be an expert in an industry. The teacher is a teacher. The employer is the employer. And I think that um, getting those roles clear is critical if you're going to create a partnership. Otherwise, it can look like you're asking an employer to become a teacher or vice versa. So, you know, the, it's enriching for everybody to have those encounters with an, uh, with an employer if, the, if it brings classroom learning to life. 
And I guess in the end, everybody's trying to, you know, giving that example of the, you know, the hinge that you described. Um, what we're, we're trying to answer there is the child that says, what's the point of doing this? And it's the employer that actually helps to answer that, if you like, the, the real life context, which is what answers that question. So everybody sees that, it's child and teacher, and everybody benefits from that experience. It's the cumulative effect. I don't think at any point, certainly at uh, the rest of this start of a teaching career, we should burden teachers with something else to do when they're already up to their eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree. You know, if you think of it, think of it as kind of that Venn diagram model where you've got, you know, teacher and employer both with their, you know, high levels of expertise. You know, a teacher, you know, knows how to, you know, manage and um, understands each of the pupils in front of them. The employer has got the high level of experience and you kind of need the two working in synergy, and that's when you get, you know, the the real impactful engagement and, you know, progress in terms of students' understanding and, you know, knowledge of workplace and all those other things that we've been discussing as part of the course. So uh, that's great, and, and I think that that really um, should provide our teachers a bit of confidence there as well and reassurance that um, that relationship you, you get what you want out of it as well and and don't feel too overwhelmed by it and and draw upon the expertise but don't become the expert yourself yeah so that's a really good message um what do you do then if you can't get responses from local employers uh, for example one of the comments that we saw in the in the course um was that you might feel as if you're pestering them to be engaged with you gerald what what, what advice would you give well i think it, it, at the outset if it feels like you're pestering then you've perhaps not got your story straight uh so i think you know one thing is certainly the model that we support and have developed uh employer engagement is step four it's not step one and that's because those earlier steps are essential in order that when you do pick up the phone or knock on the door or however you approach the employer with an email or whatever uh, you've got a compelling proposition where the employer is likely to say that sounds interesting and I can see how I could get around to doing that rather than feeling like it's an overwhelming re request which they haven't possibly got the time to do or, or expertise to do you know they're not you're asked to be a surrogate teacher for example so you know it's critical that the pitch is right that the proposition is compelling so the employer is likely to say sure why would i not do that that that's the kind of win-win arrangement in fact we were just talking about earlier um, having said that employers are busy so they do sometimes need reminders and that's fine yeah i mean you know there's certainly things i would um echo from you know gerald's experiences there I would say, you know, don't lose heart. You know, as you know, as we say, you know, business pressures fluctuate, school pressure fluctuates through the year. You know, we've got busy times of exams where we know it's going to be difficult to do things. Exactly the same for business. You know, and we need to, you know, just sort of bear that in mind. So don't lose heart. But it comes back to, like Gerard said, you know, it's the groundwork prior is the important bit. So it's about, you know, have you done a bit of basic research um, to start with? You know, have you, um, you know, got that, like Gerard said, have you got that ask? Is it clear what you're actually, why you're contacting them in the first place? You know, no one's got time to waste, neither teacher nor employer. So make sure those things are done um, first. And then I would say, you know, if you are struggling, um, Sometimes it's about starting with easier options. So use some of the networks that are out there that have already got relationships with business. So, you know, whether it's the STEM ambassador program through STEM, whether it's, you know, the local enterprise partnership or EBP, whether it's one of the professional bodies such as Institute of Physics or Royal Society of Chemistry, these organizations have some relationships with business and they can maybe sort of be you know, an easy way in for your first encounter rather than you necessarily feeling that you've got to make the cold call yourself. Um, so, and you probably will want to do that because there might be something bespoke that you've sort of identified. Um, and it just comes back to those steps that, you know, Gerard has, you know, talked people through earlier on in the course. You know, those are important steps for um, increasing the probability that you're going to have um, positive engagement. 
And of course, from STEM Learning's point of view, the STEM Ambassador Hubs distributed throughout the um, throughout the UK um, have those relationships with local employers as well. Um, but they also have a way of of managing that process, um, particularly for those initial engagements as well when you're just starting out. That the, the the hubs are there to support that. So there are organisations across the country that will help you broker that initial engagement um as well as designing it in as as a bigger project um even just for the one or two lesson um type engagement or even supporting you as a teacher if you're putting together the curriculum if you've maybe you've got an inset day uh, in your department then you can actually bring in employers through the stem ambassador scheme as well to help you with with that and that that planning Um, so it's based upon that as well, actually, when you're bringing employers um, into the classroom, um, for example, if, you, if you've got an employer coming in who can only make it for one or two classes, as a teacher, you might feel that other classes in that year group who haven't had access to that engagement might be at a disadvantage. So how can we provide a more equitable experience where we have a limitation on how we can in- engage employers? Um so I think this is the, you know, the discussion around equitable and equal. So schools are, and I'll link back to maybe the introduction that Sir John Holman did to the course right at the beginning. So schools are currently, you know, they're going through processes of evaluating um, their employer engagement, their career guidance program. They are looking at that against um, those eight sort of benchmarks that Sir John sort of mentioned right at the beginning of the course. And as part of that, they need to demonstrate that they're addressing the needs of, you know, each and every child, whether they are, you know, a higher retainer, whether they have a, a pupil who may be, maybe got some special educational needs and everybody in between. And therefore, what we find is schools are starting to actually track encounters at a pupil level. And that means that they're starting to think about that um, the equity of encounters and engagements with employers that each of their student has. So by knowing students, so teachers know their students, they know what encounters um, and what experiences will have most impact with them. We shouldn't get to a position where we feel that every student in a year group should have exactly the same experience because it might not suit all of the, you know, all of the children that are in that particular cohort. So this is about understanding the young people in front of us as teachers and it's understanding their need and strategic about maybe who is and for what purpose, because that particular experience might have more impact with some students than others. Um, it's about not feeling that every student in every year group has to have the same experience. Um, and I think that it's about looking at ways that we can increase the impact. So if an employer, for example, can come in and do a session with 30 students, how can we increase that impact? So, you know, looking at technology, we're using Skype. Um, we can we can film those experiences. We can post them on school internal portals or websites so that a wider audience can, you know, sort of have some of the value of that experience as well. So it's for me, it's about thinking about each and every child, um, but not necessarily thinking that each and every child has to experience exactly the same thing. I would agree with many of the things you said. Certainly, um, I'll I completely agree with the starting point, which is the statutory duty for each school, which is for each child to be equipped to make an informed choice. And actually, I would agree that targeting can be appropriate because if the school understands the needs of each child, then they can choose in an informed way what is the right experience for that child to have, which will guide them and help them to make that informed choice. My experience is that tends not to happen. Actually, the question was phrased in a way which suggested what was going to happen was rationing rather than uh, targeting. And I don't think that's uh, the right thing to do. And I think you touched on some of the ways that uh, it's possible to make these kind of encounters inclusive. And I think that's actually the golden opportunity that embedding careers in the curriculum presents because every child is going to go through those curriculum subjects, certainly at Key Stage 3, and, you know, if you're talking key stage four courses, then why shouldn't all the young people 
in that on that course had the opportunity to learn from the encounter with an employer. The other thing I'd say about using technology is that very often the employer, when if they are coming into the classroom, and that's typically the request that's made of employers, can you come in and talk? Actually, it's often better if it's in the workplace. Yeah. And A, because it can become inclusive because you, know, you create a, a resource that can be shown in any classroom at any time, including the following year when the, the topic is, is covered again. Uh, but also because it shows the employer in their workplace situation. And so, in effect, you're getting like a, uh, a mini workplace visit, uh, a virtual workplace visit for the students. And it can often be more powerful to see them in their workplace, you know, not dressed up in a suit, for example, or in an environment that looks attractive and, and quite cool. You know, that, those kind of things can be very influential rather than seeing somebody at the front of a classroom looking, frankly, just like a teacher. And uh, so I think that shouldn't be forgotten. The other thing I'd say about that is that sometimes that's used as an excuse to dismiss the possibility of, for example, filming a recording, which is one of the reasons that we frequently do, do uh, in, in interviews with uh, employers at the start of a curriculum project where they may be talking about themselves, talking about the organization, setting a challenge and saying, yeah. look forward to seeing what you do about this and we'll be coming in to see your work. Um, is to use things like mobile phone technology and uh, Microsoft Movie Maker, it's stuff that's just readily available. You don't need a film crew to do this. And not only is it cheaper and practical to do it that way, it's more credible from the student's perspective. They are utterly used to seeing stuff that's been filmed on a mobile phone. And I think they're more likely to believe that and be on the edge of their seats about it than if they see some highly polished corporate video. I think that point you've made there, um, Gerard, is, is is actually also about using time most efficiently. Um, so if you do have uh, perhaps limited access to employers or more likely limited access in your um, teaching time, yeah. um, that if you've got a two minute video from the employer who sets up the yeah. activity, yeah. they can then come in later on. Exactly. And actually the, the value of that interaction where they're providing feedback yeah on the student's work is far more valuable than them coming and just talking. Exactly. So you're using the time that you have most efficiently, using the technology where appropriate, um, where if you are just doing a, a one-way talking at someone, well, then that can be taken out of the classroom. That yeah. can be put somewhere else. And, of course, that makes it not only a better resource for use in the classroom, it makes it a more compelling proposition for the employer. Rather than saying, can you come in and give up a whole morning of your time? and be in a situation where you'll feel like a fish out of water. If you say, I'm going to nip across to your workplace when you've got 10 minutes in between meetings or whatever their role happens to be, and they like to say, yeah, sure, I can fit that in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we skirted, I think we skirted around perhaps one of the, the tricky issues, which is um, if, you, if you're a teacher who's got the choice between bringing in um, an employer for one class out of three, or no classes, what's the best situation to be in? If, if that is your only option, to, yeah, I can do it for one class, there is no way I can do it for my other two, should I say I can't, because I can't do it for everyone, I shouldn't do it at all? Well, Neil touched on it, it's about, it's about targeting. So if there's a selection to be made, then make sure the right students are in front of that employer, if there really is that uh, restriction. But I think what we've touched on is that there are more creative ways of ensuring that every child does get the encounter and it ends up being a resource, uh, a classroom resource or some sort of project which could be repeated, reused and makes efficient use of the employer's time. And um, of course, with uh, linking STEM curriculum to careers learning, we're not just talking about employer engagement. No, no. There are other ways there of are. doing it. So um, if you can't have that employer engagement, think a bit more creatively um, about what's available. So the resources that are available, the activities that are available as well. So yeah, uh, just sort of picking up on that as well. Um, I, I think that, you know, absolutely, you know, there are, you know, the creative ways, um, you know, coming back to the sort of the black and white question, you know, sometimes engagement with employers, you know, can start quite small and, and they may have, be quite comfortable, you know, with doing what we've sort of said there, maybe just sort of saying, well, I can come in and speak to one class and we can target, you know, the right students. 
but sometimes that's the the start of a relationship um you know and often they might be sort of you know testing you know their confidence and sort of the relationship themselves and often you know those will then lead to you know more strategic things that you can think about and new ways of working etc so personally my advice is you know unless there's a really good reason i wouldn't i would probably never say no to someone because i think you know it's obviously it can often be the start of a, an ongoing longer term sustained relationship with with a an external stakeholder cheers thank you for that um our final topic or question um is on the idea of colleagues supporting each other so um let's one of our participants on the course has, has taken the course there they seem to be um the first person in their department or their school who's who's leading on this uh what can they actually do to support other colleagues in their department to get on board with this idea of careers linked learning gerard well, I think actually that is a situation where it's legitimate for, you know, one teacher who may have one class to focus on their class. Uh, that may be a perfectly reasonable way in, in which, uh, or reason, a rationale for uh, only involving one class. But I think uh, I, I would understand, and I do understand schools when they say, look, we're going to try this small scale first because we haven't done this before. That That's reason, uh, that's understandable. But I think, you know, to answer the question, how do you encourage other teachers or support from others actually you show good practice you share good practice and uh, there's nothing more encouraging that sort of staff room discussion where somebody says do you did you know the difference it made in that topic which was brought to life by and then they they, they recount the story that's a lot more compelling than reading an article in tes about some school you know 200 miles away that did something similar you know when your own colleague is saying this works you are likely to respond by saying, how did you do it? I wonder if it would work in my area of, of teaching as well. Neil? Um, so I think that throughout the course from the very beginning, um, and I think in most chapters, we've highlighted the importance of um, leadership and buy-in from leadership. So middle, you know, middle leadership and senior leadership in schools. So ultimately, you know, they are able to put systems and structures in place for planning, for training, for support, for evaluation. However, we know that, you know, a teacher may be, um, you know, sort of going it alone to start with. And we're trying to maybe change, you know, culture from sort of bottom up. So um, as a teacher, you know, you are an advocate. Um, and as Gerard sort of picked up, you know, sharing your experience, your best practice, um, you know, the potential of simple case studies that can be shared with wider staff and wider networks. Um, never underestimate the power of student voice, I would say. So students talk about their experiences and can influence the practice of teachers as much as fellow teachers. Um, Allow others to observe, you know, what you're doing. If you're working with an employer, if you're working on an employer project, um, allow others to come in and sort of see the students at work and what they're doing. Um, maybe help to sort of co-plan to start with. So, so teachers who haven't started yet, you could sort of sit and do some planning. Two brains are always better than one. And, you know, in schools, we can vastly reduce the amount of time we spend planning by working in teams. Um, share your resources, you know, with your department and with others. And I guess finally to try and influence those who can allow time, whether it's in faculty department meetings or whether it's in wider school CPD, trying to influence those to build it in as part of a process, I think is really important. I think that's a really important point about the leadership involved because the risk is if you've got one keen teacher it ends up just being a flash in the pan so it has to be systemic the change that's that's taking place other and therefore without that leadership not just support but really initiative and uh, drive then it's unlikely to go much further than you know one or two enthusiasts whether that's the career specialists or whether it's a, a teacher that's just got a particular interest in bringing their subject teaching to life um, the other thing I'd perhaps reinforce what you said is, um, you know, it's great colleague peer-to-peer -peer is powerful and clearly things like the careers hubs um, can be 
uh, uh, the, you know, these are growing and emerging, and they are a, uh, can be a could be a powerful vehicle. Likewise, across multi academy trusts, where there are schools where they are required to work collaboratively, sharing resources and so on. But I think he did touch on the student voice, and one of the things that I've got to say, you know, when we're supporting or facilitating uh, projects, is most powerful. We usually try to capture alongside all the material that's gathered on the project, and it's really important to sort of try and follow the gather the narrative, uh, the student examples of student work, the uh, resources that were created in the classroom. You know, the everything that goes with it. So that if somebody says, "How did you do that?" You've got the wherewithal to, to share that and best of all share that within some kind of CPD context. In that CPD context the most powerful things that we ever show are youngsters speaking before and after a project. Uh, it's much more powerful by a factor of 10 than anything else that's gathered because everybody believes those um, voices which just speak you know, honestly and often innocently without quite really realizing the power of what they're saying. Whereas if a teacher says it, people might say, well, I'd expect to hear that from a professional. But if a youngster says it, it's likely to be believed. Absolutely. Thank you both for your responses there. Um, we covered an awful lot of ground and I, I'm, I'm finding it a really interesting uh, conversation to be part of. So thank you very much for, for being here, for recording the, your responses. Thank you. Um, so thank you for all our participants on the course, uh, linking STEM curriculum learning to careers. The course will run again uh, next term and we will uh, do a summary of the responses and we'll upload those onto the course site as well. So thank you very much.